chat is on. Sir Ladies Chatterleys. All right. And we're on. Well, welcome. All right. Today's Monday. Uh, it is the 21st of March, 2022. This is Mark coming to you from Baker's Green Acres. I'm going to be your host tonight on the Anyone Can Farm live stream chat. And so let's get started right away. I thought tonight we'll talk about something that's going to be happening here tomorrow um, because it is that time of year it is the time of year when we get ready for spring and one of the things we like to do in the spring is start mushroom logs it's just a a real nice facet on the homestead you've always got mushrooms coming in every time you get a, a good rainstorm we go out there and got some new mushrooms so that's what I want to talk about tonight. And we will take questions. A um, few things first. We are going to have, let's see, we're going to have the uh, Tribe Day. It's coming on the 9th of July. And that's the Anyone Can Farm Tribe Day, of course. That's where you all are welcome on the farm we're going to allow people to camp here uh friday night the day in question is the saturday that's going to be the all-day event um we'll probably roast a hog and we'll probably you know barbecue some chickens and people will bring stuff and uh last year it was sort of impromptu but we had 85 people that showed had a good time too real good time <clears throat> I'm not seeing any chattage here. How's that look? Is the chat on now? I see the six people in, but I haven't seen anything yet. Try chatting a little bit, folks. See if I can see you. <clears throat> mm. No? Uh, well, we'll see. I think Jill's probably in the other room watching this, so she'll let me know what's going on. Oh, no, she won't. I'm on her laptop. So... I don't know what's going on here. All right. Well, anyway, uh, Tribe Day is coming. Really looking forward to it. Uh, in the interim of that, though, we are going to have our annual, and I guess this will be the third year that we've done this, maybe the second, hmm. uh, seed swap. So that's also a Saturday, but that's not a camp over or a cookout or anything like that. We'll have lunch, but it'll just be a potluck. And, uh, you know, last year people came and we swapped seeds. People brought a whole bunch of stuff. There was a bunch of plants that came and uh, all kinds of stuff came. And then people swapped it. You know, a couple of people talked, talked about propagation. I think we did a little walk around the farm. Uh, maybe talked about weeds a little bit, but it was sort of a, just a day to relax and spend some time together, which is pretty important these days, I think. Uh, it's about time that the community, the, the small farms community, the uh, homestead community comes together. Whatever, any, any chance we get, we should come together. Uh, we had people over this weekend, Sunday, yeah, just yesterday, and it was just sort of a minute. I just called. It was a nice day, and I just called a few friends. They want to want to have a barbecue, and it was like, yeah. <laughs> and we did. And we had fun, and I think everybody's spirits were lifted today. Mine were. I uh, got up this morning, and it was kind of a drab, dreary, cold, rain, rainy day. But I felt good today. You know, it was nice to spend time with people. So I think we need to do that whenever we can. It's up to us to do it too. You can't. Uh, uh, you can't wait to be asked. You just got to go ahead and do it. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing the chat come in here. Let me, excuse me a second while I yell to my oak son. Hey, Joe, I have no chat here. That's the best way to do that. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm doing. This doesn't look quite right, though. Um, yeah, I guess the 
Chat, you're on. Yeah, they're chatting on there. Uh huh. Um, you try reloading. Sure, we're gonna reload real quick. chat okay that looks like it's gonna work that looks good all right that's good okay I can see it now thank you all right we got it joy can be found in the garden what day is tribe day that is the 9th of July 9th of July, and that's a day when you can <clears throat> bring your kids. Don't bring any dogs. No dogs. Do not bring dogs to the farm, okay? She said what? Oh, never mind. You can bring kids, but no dogs. No dogs. People bring dogs to the farm, but that doesn't work because we have uh, working dogs here, and it kind, of, it kind of spoils them a little bit if they get used to other dogs coming. We want them to actually kill other dogs. So please don't bring your dogs. Yeah, go ahead and bring a cat. That'll be fine. Goats. Just no dogs. All right. All right, cool. So uh, that's Tribe Day and Seed Saving Day is good. Or uh, Seed Swap Day is going to be April 16th. So just... For your information, my birthday is the 15th, so if you want to bring gifts with you, that'd be okay, too. That'd be fine. All right. Looking forward to that. We had fun time last time. Anytime we can get together is fun. All right, so tonight I wanted to talk about mushrooms. Um, we started doing mushrooms probably 15 years ago, and it was in conjunction with a, um, a class that we went to at the Small Farms Conference. Haven't been to the Small Farm, Farms Conference in a while, but it used to be that the Small Farms Conference was uh, just, just other farmers that would speak about what they were doing and if they were talking about something that you didn't know anything about and you wanted to learn you went and this man came over i believe it's from minnesota <clears throat> and um i'm not sure if i have his catalog here yet i was gonna look for it but maybe there's one in the box i just got a shipment from him the other day and he he was an impressive guy uh um he actually ran a mushroom business so he had a vast yard of of mushrooms and uh i remember at the time thinking this guy just did what he could with what he had and i think he was operating on like 10 acres i think and um, it was wooded, and he wanted to do something, wanted to stay home, homesteading-wise. And, you know, he couldn't – the place wasn't set up to graze cattle. It wasn't set up to milk cows. It wasn't set up to do any of those things. And he uh, searched and then found mushrooms, and the place was set up to do that. And um, – he not only grew mushrooms for himself, he wound up starting up a business and supplying people with all the things that they need to grow their own mushrooms. And when I met him, he'd come over to the Small Farms Conference and he just gave us a kind of a brief class. It was a one hour class. And he says, hey, I'm going to be coming back over in uh, a couple months if you guys want to come to uh a full day class uh we're gonna have it and they had it over in at a high school over in mayo which is uh, about an hour and a half from me and so me and my son joe went over there for the day 
and sat in on this class. And I still have the notes from the class. Um, I took like a three pages of notes, but I have them pretty well memorized. I don't really need them here. Um, and so we did, you know, we ordered spore from him and there were a couple kinds of mushrooms that we thought we wanted to do. Uh, and, uh, we went for it, you know, we went for it and we've had mushrooms ever since, ever since. Now I don't grow them in vast quantities because we really don't need them in vast quantities for a family my size. You know, I suppose if a bunch more came in than, than what does come in, maybe we would dry them and then start to, you know, put them up for winter time. Uh, we don't do that though. We just have fresh mushrooms in the summertime and it seems to be good enough. It seems to be good enough for what we want to do. All right. I'm going to try and keep up with the chat tonight. Last week I lost, I lost track of it really. I really lost track of it. All right. Just did our last hog class of the season. Eight more students through building season starts next Monday. All right. Right on. And there's a guy that just takes by the bull by the horns and does it. Nancy, my pigs dug into the adjacent chicken run over the weekend. LOL. So I am building a bigger pen up back. You mean back up? <laughs> uh, pigs digging is just the way pigs are. Um, our advice on pigs is make sure you have electric on the inside. Have one strand of electric on the inside. Ooh, Nancy Dort changed her picture. That's a different picture of you, Nancy. You want... A strand, you want it, it when they're little pigs, you just have it six inches off the ground. When they get a little bit bigger, about a foot, right? And that will keep your pigs in. That'll keep them from digging. They won't, they'll dig, but they won't dig close to the edge of the fence. Chickens were not, not impressed. Well, pigs will eat the chickens, that's for sure. Okay, we got Ben Carlson with us. Ghost. Mark likes Crown Royal. No, I don't. I used to. That was like 30 years ago. No Crown Royal, please. Are we going to do a raffle? Um, you know, I, I, that's not me. That will be Jill and probably Amy and probably uh, Rachel Jamerson. I, I think they're going to handle all that. They're probably going to do some sort of fundraiser for the classroom probably and i should give you guys an update on the classroom i really should um uh, mark likes goats yeah i like goats yep you'll need an electric fence yes <clears throat> all right so as far as let's just let's talk about mushrooms and uh I got a good mushroom story to relate, um, and it actually relates to Crown Royal, too. Uh, way back when I was stationed in Japan, I lived off base because when I got there, I was junior ranking, and I couldn't get a base house. Base houses had heat. Off base, house, off base houses don't have heat. They actually do not have furnaces in them. It doesn't get real cold there like it does here. You get snow a couple times, but it get, it's pretty cold. It's pretty darn cold. And uh, so what most people do is they will have a kerosene heater. It's just one of those ones that you take outside, you put kerosene in it, you bring it in, it's got a circular wick in it, and then you light it, and then it burns, and it makes everything smell like kerosene, and you got to buy the kerosene. If you run out of kerosene, you're cold, and, you know, it's just... It's, uh, I did a lot of that, but uh, I thought there was a better way. And me being, uh, you know, the, the welder extraordinaire type person that I am, I thought, I'm going to build me a wood stove. And here I am 
live in, in this really compact area, you know, my Japanese neighbors literally, literally were four feet away. So there was two feet in between, actually it wasn't in feet, but it was two feet in between me and a short wall. And then from that wall, it was two feet to the house, the next house. So you could actually hear them when, you know, bedrooms were close, right? They're four feet. You could hear them in their bedroom. And it was, you know, it was pretty close living. And here I, I think about doing this. I think, what was I thinking? Because Japanese people are really worried about fire. They really don't like fire. And imagine that, you know, after the fire bombings and stuff, because the houses are so close that one house fire turns into multiple house fires. And uh, yeah, not real good. And here I was, I had this little tiny yard and it was kind of closed in with foliage and stuff. So I did stuff in the yard and nobody could really see what I was doing. And uh, I built a wood stove out of um first out of an oil barrel right and that worked pretty good but it didn't throw a lot of heat and it was you know pretty weak um and it kind of wore itself out after a little while and then i built another one out of some steel that i scrounged and i welded it together in such a way and that was a good one but then i wanted to build another one you know i needed a better one than that got you Russian. And uh, so my third one was extraordinary. It was just extraordinary. And I thought, I'm going to heat the entire house with this. And uh, I didn't really know a lot about wood stoves. I thought I did, but I really didn't. And uh, but anyway, I, uh, I didn't have any real mishaps with the wood stove. Uh, and it worked out pretty good. No one ever said anything. I just did it. But living in Japan, it was a constant uh, quest for firewood. Constant quest. So I was always looking for it. And uh, a lot of times I would cut up pallets and use those. Uh, you know, I was always on the lookout for things. I would look at the the chocks that would be out on the flight line, those big wooden chocks. And I'd think, man, if I could get some of those, you know, I could burn those. And so I was always, always looking for wood. And there was a guy that worked in my shop that was Japanese. He was a, he was Japanese national and he spoke English pretty good. And I says, how do you ask for uh, firewood? And he says, uh, Maki Kudasai. And Maki is firewood, and I want some, please, right? And so I've never forgot that, Maki Kudasai. And uh, where I lived, I lived out on the edge of town, Fusa City, and then if I drove for 10 minutes, I was in the absolute boondocks. Like, they build very close to each other. They keep everybody close in. But then you drive out a little ways and it's the boondocks. There's nothing there. You can just keep going. You won't see anything for a long, long way until you get to the next town. And uh, I used to spend a lot of time out of town because I couldn't stand it after a while. It was just so crowded. In. Um, Japanese people, and you want to talk about annoying, barking dogs. I mean, they will put a dog on the corner of their driveway, which is only deep enough for them to park a really small car on if they have a car. And they'll have a cage there with a dog in it that they never take out. And the things just bark constantly at everything or at nothing. And so you're you're trying to listen. You're, tr you're trying to just be. And it's like over here, over here, over here they're everywhere so it drives you crazy and i'm still uh still suffering from ptsd from it i think but um i used to just have to get out of town because it just drove me up the wall and uh so um one time 
I was out in my quest for firewood. Uh, I did not have a gas-powered chainsaw over there. I had an electric-powered chainsaw. You could not go into a store and buy a gasoline chainsaw. I don't know why. They just didn't have them on the shelf. I did see loggers had them, but the average Japanese person couldn't buy one, so I was on their economy. I couldn't buy one either. But I had a Makita uh, electric chainsaw, and I used to do a lot of cutting with that, but I couldn't take it out to the woods with me. So um, I mentioned my second wood stove that I built, and it was a good one. And then there was a guy that I met, another GI. What was his name? It was Ken something. I remember his last name now. But he was like, ooh, that's pretty good. Could you build me one of those? And I said, yeah, I probably could. I said, I'm, I'm thinking about building another one. You want this one? He says, yeah. What do you want for it? He says, I said, I don't know. What do you got to trade? He says, how about this van? So he had this van. I still have a picture of it. And it was a Toyota van. It was a four-speed on the column. It had sliding doors on both sides and a hatch on the back, sort of like the van that I have now. Uh, it was super uh, utilitarian. It was the back seat was a bench seat, and it folded folded up. Uh, steel floors, no frills at all. None at all. No radio, nothing. But I liked it. I really did. So that was my wood getting machine. I That was my truck. And so I took that everywhere to go get wood. So anyway, I was at this place that I cruised quite a bit, and I was looking for a house that I'd seen, and I was going to ask the guy if I could go in his woods and get some wood. And I'm looking around. I didn't see anybody. You know, there's no house. There's nothing for a long ways. I'm going through the woods, and all of a sudden, I find this huge stack of wood. Huge stack of wood. And it's all hardwood. And it's all, like, four-foot lengths. And they were stacked up, you know, like this. Right? They were stacked up like this, and they were up like six feet high. I thought, wow, look at, they stacked all this wood out here. They're just leaving it. It's, it's even getting kind of rotten. I wonder what's going on with this. <laughs> and so there was nobody around, and I thought, it's just going to be out here rotten, so I might as well take a truckload of it. So I did. <laughs> nobody said anything. I didn't see anybody. Um, and it was one of those weird deals where I wound up where I was, and once I drove myself out of there, I could not really remember how I got in there. Again. So I never found that place again. But uh, hmm. I uh, I got home. It, this was in the, I think it was in the summertime. And I cut it all up and I stacked it alongside the house. And... From that side of the house to the road, it was two feet. So two feet from the house, there was a wall. The road was right there. And you could barely get two Japanese cars down the road. These roads were really narrow. And this Japanese woman that lived on the other side of me was walking down the road, and she started exclaiming something in Japanese about these logs and all these beautiful mushrooms that were on these logs that had grown. I hadn't noticed it. And um, so she said, she, you, you know, do you want some? And she did. She took some and she took a whole bunch of them. And then I think she brought some back over after she sauteed them. And I ate some of them and they were good. And uh, I wound up telling this story to my neighbor, who was another GI, and he lived behind me, right? And I remember him, Jim Stallard, and he was from Minnesota. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, we were, it was a Saturday, so I'm sure we were unwinding from the 
rigorous work week. And there was probably some, a matter of fact, I know there was some crown Royal involved. I know I remember it. <clears throat> yeah, vividly. And, um, I'm telling this story. I'm saying, Hey, you guys, why don't we cook some of these? You know, we're having a barbecue, right? Just all these GIs. And the guys were like, no, I'm not going to eat those things. You never know. You, a lot of these guys have gone through survival training. Don't eat mushrooms. They can kill you. I said, I already had some of them. They're all right. That lady over there, the lady that this lady cooked uh, mackerel for breakfast every day. And there'd be smoke coming out of the back of the house. It's mackerel. Ugh, terrible smell. But um, so somebody went over and cut some of them off. And I think might have been me. And then we cut them up on a table and I ate some and some other people ate some. We wound up eating a whole bunch of them. And they were really pretty good. They were shiitakes. I know this now. And uh, so anyway, but I don't know if it was the shiitakes or the crown royal, but uh, yeah, I wound up not feeling too good that night. And uh, But don't worry, I evacuated everything. So that's how come I remember it was crown royal night. So anyway and that was my mushroom story that's how it all began actually that's <laughs> that had nothing to do with us, us raising mushrooms but we do raise shiitake mushrooms we happen to like them pretty well and so i would like to talk a little bit about how we do that i have the box of mushroom spores right over there and it hasn't been opened up so i bet you there's probably a catalog in there but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how this is done because I'm going to do this tomorrow. Joe's going to film it and we're going to make sort of a, you know, good, good content out of it. And it's, it's a nice thing to do. It's sort of, you can do it with your kids, everybody. Okay. We're going to do mushrooms. Oh, fun. You know, it's like low, low impact work. It's not like anybody hates doing mushrooms. It's easy. The hardest part is cutting the trees so let's talk first about the trees that you're going to need uh you use hardwood species right maple is what we use all the time i just always do uh because if you find maple trees that are have suckered you know like there's a stump and then they sucker off of that and you get limbs coming out of the ground like that sometimes they're called coppices but and they're about like this big around, they're never going to do anything. They're just going to sucker out like that. They're going to be down low. They wind up drooping down and they're, uh, they don't do anybody any good. So you might as well use them for making mushrooms or cordwood. And so a lot of, uh, the discussion about mushrooms is actually forest management too. So if you have forested land, uh, I think what people think of is, well, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to cut out the big stuff so the little stuff can grow. Well, that's actually not really a good idea. Uh, what you really want to do is the big trees, you want to give them room to get even bigger. So you go, you go in underneath. And you cut out all the small trees that are like this, maples, or uh, any other hardwoods if they're oaks. Um, this is actually a good conversation to have for people that like to talk about mangalitsa pigs. Because let's say you want to get into some sort of farming operation, and uh, but you've got woodland, you know, you don't. And so then, well, I better get in there and clear those trees out so I can raise pigs. No, 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 no. No, you don't want to do that. Especially if you have uh, oak trees or hazelnut trees or really any kind of tree that's going to drop a nut or an acorn, something like that. You want to leave those and actually want those to get even bigger and have more room to grow and more nutrient in the so in the soil so they can drop more acorns or more butternuts or more black walnuts whatever it is because that is feed for the pigs and the pigs will be really happy to be under those trees rooting around and playing around in there 
Um, and the big trees, they can't hurt them. They, well, they can, but they're just less likely to because the uh, the bark on big, big trees is just thick and, you know, woody. And it's not, they're never going to get anything green off of that. Where uh, a, a sapling, something that's big, this big around, even on the bottom, you can scratch it with your thumbnail and you get green. And so that's perfect for a pig. They'll just gnaw on that and they'll get that, that bark off of there. So you don't want that. Um, if you cut off uh, a sapling, then what happens is it suckers. If you have pigs in there, as soon as it suckers out and it's like this long, whoop, they'll take it off. They'll eat it, right? So you will eventually do away with that, with that root system. Not a bad thing because it'll break down and then it becomes nutrient for the bigger trees, right? So that's a good thing. So uh, mushroom production can be seen as something that you can do with all these smaller trees that you're going to selectively cut out. Right. And uh, that that's sort of reverse thought process. Like if you were to talk to a logger, he would say, well, that's dumb. You want to cut out those big ones because we can make saw logs out of those and we can pay you for them. But in the end, really, when you do that, it's not as profitable as uh, they make it sound. And they make a friggin mess of, of a woodlot, really make a mess. If you've ever seen a woodlot that somebody has gone in, selectively cut, like I said, take out all, all the small stuff, and then you have a re super high canopy, and it's open under there, so you can see quite far. It is a thing of beauty. It really is a thing of beauty. When you walk into it, it's like uh, an enchanted forest. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. It's just a really nice feeling to be able to look up in these trees, and then this a lot of life in the trees. It provides good habitat. Uh, the birds can fly in amongst the trees, you know, if it's not super thick. Uh, and it's a nice, just a nice place. So I, I would strive for that. And if you, uh, let's say, fenced in a section of it and then subdivided that with portable fencing or temp fencing, not netting, but uh, temp fencing, single strand, uh, or double strand, maybe. Um, you could rotate your pigs in there and you would really do the forest a lot of good because they'll disturb it. They'll do a little digging in there. They'll, uh, you know, a tree is going to drop, a big tree is going to drop a foot of leaves easily. And then it composts down and, you know, but if the pigs get in there and they turn that up, you know, they're looking for, you know, a walnut that fell four years ago, but I'm going to get that thing and they're just going to dig down and aerate. They'll do the forest a lot of good, really well. Excuse me here. So uh, the types of wood that you can use, I guess you can use any kind of wood, but it's preferred to use hardwoods. Um, the catalog, you know, just says that oak, oak and uh, and maple are the best. So I've just stayed with maple because I'm in Maple City. You know, we have a lot of maple trees around here. So I've just always stuck with those. So those are the ones I can talk about. Um, so you can cut. Uh, you want to start with a tree that's no more than eight inches in diameter right? And you can cut that in any log length that you prefer uh, that you can handle, right? So if you're not able to handle a lot of weight, cut it in one foot sections, you know, an eight inch log in one foot sections, you can do that. If you can handle a four footer, and that's what we do, we cut them in four feet. And even the eight eight inch one on the bottom, I mean, it's heavy, but it, it you can handle it because you do wind up moving these things around a little bit. Okay. So um, tomorrow, what I will do is I will put a trailer on the Jeep. I will drive down. 
uh, there's a place where I know that there's a bunch of trees that are never going to amount to anything. It's one of those scenarios where there was a stump there and you had a bunch of suckers come off, but they're pretty good size. They're about this big and it's just like a clump of trees. It's in the way of something else that I want to do. So I've been going to do it for a couple of years. Uh, tomorrow is the day. So I will just cut them off, section them up four feet. I mean, I'll, uh, my chainsaw, I've got a way of measuring with the chainsaw. So I will get them right at four feet and the boys will carry them out, put them in the trailer. And however many of them there that there are, that's how many we're doing in this one clump of trees. I only need really to do for what we do. If I do 10 a year, that's enough. That's, that's plenty. Uh, if you see the pile of them that we have out here, there's probably 50 logs and some of them I'm going to be retiring th probably this year. And, uh, I, I need to get a little bit smarter about what to do with those retirees. I think what you do is you, you want to grind them up because they're full of that mycelium and you want to, you know, do something with that, but I'm not, I'm not too sure about that. So, uh, we're going to bring those back to the house. I have, um, sawhorse horses set up tomorrow's going to be a rainy day. So we're going to work in the wood shop. I have sawhorses set up in there, and then I am. I'm going to go to my. I'm going to go to my drawing board here and show you what we do. Oh, I don't have the drawing board. Since we rooted it, it went away. So I, I really can't do that, unless Jill toddles out here and sets it up for me. Well, it's not really necessary. I can talk through it, I guess. But I'm going to cut these logs at four feet. Now, time of the year that you cut these is critical. Uh, you do not want to cut them much later in the spring than now. You want to cut it when they're dormant. You know, you do not want to cut that log when it's got a full load of sap running up through it. You know, really don't want to do that. Even now, it's a little, little edgy. You know, I probably should have done them a little earlier. But these are small trees and. It's not like the big trees that are going to run sap um, like crazy. And I'm going to cut these in the morning, too. So I, I won't cut it when the sap is running. I, you wouldn't want to do that. So uh, we'll bring those back. And then we'll set them up on logs, on uh, sawhorses. And then we will mount these bits, this bit, this boring bit into um, a drill motor, like an electric drill motor or a air drill motor. And I'll probably just use two electrics because we're going to be working in a shop where I don't have air, right? And you can see this has got a, a screw bit on it. And then it's got a, <clears throat> it's got a collar right here that's going to limit how deep it will go into a log. And this will go into a log in about four seconds. Voop, voop, voop. And let's say that I have a four foot log. I'm going to drill right at the front, you know, I'll back in maybe about three inches, drill a hole. I will go uh, eight or 10 inches. I'll drill another hole, 10 inches more, another hole in a straight line down that log. And then I'm going to turn that log about four inches and do the same thing, only I'm going to stagger it, right? So I'm not going to go in line with the first hole. I'm going to go in the middle of those first and second hole, turn it a little bit, and then drill, and then go 10 inches and drill. So I'm staggering the holes. Does that make sense? Let's see. If I had something here I could do that on. Yeah, I do. All right. So I'm going to. You, this is the handle of the tool that you use to do this. But I'm going to use this handle as if it were a log. Right? I'm going to drill a hole here, 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 and here. Okay? See my holes? Is that cool? And then my next set of holes are going to be staggered like this. This, I think, will 
speak a thousand words. See how I staggered them? And then my next set of holes will be about where the first set of holes were, but almost on the other side of the lock. Now, I don't know how critical this is really, how, you know, the spacing on these, but I would say the closer that you have them together, the longer it's going to take you to do each log. And uh, so, you know, you're going to have more time into it. But what we're going to be doing is we have a medium. There's several ways you can do it. And this is probably where I want to go cut into the box and grab out a couple things that I can show you. I haven't used it yet. Stand by. no catalog but there's this Wisconsin yeah I got it wrong he's not a, not um, not Minnesota he's Wisconsin um, here's the name Field and Forest Products, and uh, this is giving us an idea of the different types of spawn uh, that we're going to be, that are available, all right? Um, when we took the class, the man that did this, I believe he told us that sawdust spawn is the most effective. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah, and I'm reading it here. It's there's several different types of spawn. There's grain spawn. There's plug spawn. It's just like wooden dowels and you drill the same hole and you you hammer them in this spawn. Mm -hmm. There's thimble spawn. They look like earplugs. I haven't seen those in real life. Huh. Cool. So we've got uh, two different types of spawn. We've got wine cap and shiitake. So they give us a sheet for wine caps. Yeah, it says right there, wine caps. Wine caps is like, uh, it's, it's like the, on a wine bottle, the cap on a wine bottle. That's what it looks like. The, you know. And the other one is shiitake on logs. Shiitake on logs. And that's what we plan to do. Right there. Right. And that just gives us an idea of what they're going to look like. Um, oh, it's actually got a picture of the wine cap here. See that? Okay. <clears throat> wine caps, we did one year and uh, didn't have great luck with them, but Joe did them at his house down in Ohio, and he had great luck, and so he said he wanted to to do them and we've got enough spawn here 
for both him and me to do it. So wine cap, and this is what it looks like. This is uh, the sawdust spawn, right? So this, this does break up, but what we do is we have this tool right here. And you can see it's got a plunger on this end. And when I plunge it, you see what happens, right? So what you do is you take this tool and you shove it into the spawn like that. And it, a bunch of spawn will pack in here, right? And then you put it in the hole that you've drilled in the log and go poop like that. And it just shoves it in. And what the spawn does is then it, it's got mycelium in it and the mycelium will go through the log. It will run in the log and it will, um, you know, multiply in the log. The way mushrooms work is they're, they can sense when a log has, a tree has died and then their job is to feed off that log. So they sense death, I guess, and then they grow in that area, right? So that's what we will be doing. We'll be bringing the logs in. We'll be drilling them out really quick like this with this. We'll be um, inoculating the logs with this spawn, right? So it's everything's kind of the same, a lot of the same terminology, right? You talk about inoculating biochar, right? So you're going to introduce something into it. So I'm going to introduce something into the log that, you know, if I took those logs and just set them out there where we do these other shiitake logs, there's a pretty good chance that, they could become inoculated by just being close to the other logs. Could, but they could also get inoculated with something that's out there already, like toadstools. And it's always a little, you got to be careful. Like you never want to send minor kids out to go see if there's any mushrooms. And um, you, you got to be careful because mushrooms can be pretty bad. So I've never seen something else growing on the shiitake mushrooms on the shiitake logs. I've never seen anything else grow that would be mistaken for shiitake mushroom. But the wine caps, that's kind of a different story. All of a sudden you'll see a mushroom like, what are you doing here? And if it doesn't look like the other wine caps, you don't risk it, you just let it go. Um, I got another mushroom story. This one's not so good actually. It turned out okay, but it wasn't actually so good. And you can just remember this um, so that you don't do this. But I had this friend out in Montana, and it was a really strange relationship, really strange. I met this guy. He was a friend of mine, daughter's husband. And he didn't look so good. Like here I was a GI, I was clean cut, you know, and, uh, and this guy was anything but clean cut. He was downright raggedy looking, but he was very soft spoken, very humble. And when I got to know him, he did not grow up in a very good home. And, uh, his dad had left like five kids early on and the mom had some issues. And so the kids basically were on their own. And this kid did not like going to school. Him and his younger brother didn't, didn't get into school very much. So they just stopped going. <laughs> and they lived on the river. There was a pretty good sized river coming through where we were, the Sun River, big river. And they just were, they lived on the river. They hunted deer, they trapped, they, they, found things to do. They built shelters. They came and go, came and went as they pleased. If they bought a car, they drove it <laughs> as far as plates and insurance and stuff. They were like, well, they don't know much about it. So they just didn't bother with it. And they were, 
they were different for sure, but there was something about them that I liked. And I wound up going from them and, um, you know, just they showed me a bunch of stuff that I never would have seen otherwise. And one of the things was mushrooms. And I had gone through, uh, you know, pretty extensive training about uh, not eating mushrooms, right? But for some reason, I felt safe eating mushrooms that these guys would find. And I felt like I could identify certain mushrooms. And he would call them meadow mu mushrooms. And I found some at my farm in Montana. And sure enough, they were the same ones. And I ate them and they were good. And Yeah. And so I started feeling pretty, uh, confident in my skills of identifying mushrooms, but it was based on nothing. You know, it was like, Matt would say you could eat these. So I ate them and I was okay. And I was listening to this guy <laughs> and I probably shouldn't have been all right. I probably shouldn't. He was a nice guy and everything, but, uh, yeah, it just probably wasn't the greatest idea, but he didn't die and I didn't die. So it worked out okay. He was real good at finding a wild asparagus too. It grew alongside the, the riverbanks like crazy in the spring. And uh, he showed me good places and I would be with him catching these massive trout, massive trout. I'm not kidding. Two foot trout out of little estuaries that he knew where they were. And uh, so anyway... Let's see where was this story gonna go oh yeah so we moved from montana we moved to to michigan and i was here about three days and we were walking and just looking at the property and we, we were going to go out to eat with my parent -in law and me and my son kyle like hey look at these metal mushrooms and so i picked them sliced them gave one to him i ate one we're eating them and then all of a sudden it's like these don't taste that good. Plah! Spit them out. Well, don't swallow it. Whatever. And by the time we got back to the house, I wasn't feeling so good. And neither was he. I kind of went into, well, we were in the tent then, so we weren't in the, in the house yet. And um, I kind of felt like I was getting tunnel vision. And I just kind of shook it off. Oh, it couldn't be. Couldn't be. So I uh, came out into the kitchen, and uh, this is back when I was drinking Mountain Dew. So I slugged down a Mountain Dew. This is a long time ago. This is 18 years ago. And uh, Kyle, my oldest son, rode to the restaurant in a separate vehicle. And I was riding with uh, my parents-in-law, and I said, hey, hey, slow down. I got to stop. And I got out through lunch. And by the time we got to the restaurant, I felt fine. And Kyle was, he said, no, I wasn't feeling good, but I feel okay now. So he didn't, uh, he didn't throw lunch, but anyway, that was, that turned out okay. But then I overheard some ladies talking at farmer's market one time about this particular type of mushroom and it can take your kidneys out. It can, it can ruin your kidneys. And I still know where I got that mushroom. I can take you there, and they still grow there all the time. Yeah. And I just, uh, so with mushrooms, you got to be really careful. But if you're propagating your own, uh, it's not such a dangerous thing. It's probably not a dangerous thing at all. You know, uh, I would say read all you can on it and, uh, you know, be, use some caution. I like the shiitakes because once you get them started on logs, nothing else is going to take over. I like that. Right. So let's see. I've got plenty of spawn here. That bag right there will inoculate a lot of logs. I mean, a whole lot of them. And uh, we've probably got twice as much as we need. And it was quite inexpensive for four bags of spawn like that it was 122 dollars very inexpensive it's a long-term investment you invest a little bit of time in it <clears throat> and uh set up an area where you're going to set your logs up 
So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, you're wanting to find some place that's going to be shaded. I mean, heavily shaded. If you can have like a triple canopy uh, forest or even in pines, minor in pines, and it actually works out pretty good. <clears throat> um, and the area that I use is sort of a low area. They planted pines in there a million years ago. And it's because it's it's very wet down in that area. So it stays really moist down in there. So uh, we, oh, what do you know? They have a, a diagram here of, huh, of how to inoculate your logs right there. I said 10 inches. They say 6 inches. Okay, so I guess we'll go with the 6 just to make a, a square that's a 2-inch square. Okay. I can live with that. <clears throat> um, and we just drill them, inoculate them, uh, and stack them up down there, and then we leave them alone. So when we have a rainstorm and the, the rain's dripping down through the trees and the area gets really wet, that's when the mycelium will fruit. That's when it will fruit. And that's how we do it. Now, if you were going to do this for, say, a market that you were going to go to, you would want to what they call force fruit them. And that can be done several ways. You can set up a, a trough where you would take the logs and you would take them off the stack and put them in the trough and wake them so they're underwater. And then you'd take those off and you'd stack them again and they should fruit within 24 hours. So if you had a Friday market, let's say, you would probably want to do this on a Tuesday. And then Wednesday, Thursday, they fruit. You could harvest, take it to the market on Friday, right? You could do that. I've never done that. I just never have. So we just rely on the rain. We get enough rain here in the summertime. Another thing you can do that would be really uh, nice is if you set them up, uh, let's say that you uh, set them up, you put two here and then two here on top of a, sort of like a, a log cabin. And then you put a micro sprinkler up on top of that, maybe down inside that would you could turn on and it would. So if you have, let's say, I think we have six or eight stacks out here like that. I could have a micro sprinkler in each one of them. And then once a week, I could go out and turn that on, let it run for 24 hours and shut it off. In a couple of days, I'm going to have fruit that there. And the other ones, I won't, unless it rains. Um, and that way, I have a little bit of control. Because sometimes you go out there and you get a bucket of mushrooms. And it's like, well, we eat what we can, have three, four meals of mushrooms. Oh, okay, that's enough mushrooms. And some of them actually go to waste. They, they go to the pigs. But um, Okay, Inga's asking, where do we order spawn from? Right there. Field Forest Products. Okay. Huh. All right. They got a lot more information than I remember. This is actually pretty good. I haven't seen these before. And this spawn will be good for uh, for the season. So we want to use this up this season. Anything we don't want to use, we'll want to refrigerate. And maybe we can hold it over to the next season. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But we'll we'll make good on it. Uh, I think that if you come to the seed, seed swap day, I'm going to have some of this left over. So I'll break it into smaller quantities and people can take it with them if they want. That's what I'll do. Yeah. But if you uh, if you do order from those guys, you can tell them that you heard it here from Baker's Green Acres because I, I haven't seen them. In, you know, it's been 
probably 12 years. I haven't seen them, but they were really nice people. It was a family business. This guy, I remember he had, he had done so much inoculating that from hitting it, he had a big callus right there on his palm from bush. Cause this thing's pretty rough, right? Doing that a million times, but she, he showed pictures, slides of his place. And he grew uh, mushrooms commercially, right? So he supplied, I don't know, markets and stuff. And it was quite the operation. And I remember it was mostly his children that worked for him. So it was pretty neat setup. All right. That's, uh, that's that, I guess. Let's see if I got any questions here that I can, that I can expound on. Andy Zumbalt's with us tonight. All right. Where you been, man? Justin's with us. Here's an interesting thing. The ghost is saying those shiitake mushrooms are the best. The common button mushrooms reportedly have a bad chemical in them and are carcinogenic, according to Paul's Stamets. Ooh, and he gives the agar agaricus basaurus. Well, that's not this. The wine cap, I think, would be the closest to the button mushroom, and this is Strophaeria rugosa annuleta. So I don't think that's the same one. I'm glad because I don't want that. I'll, I'll tell you what it says about wine cap mushrooms. Wine cap mushroom is one of the easiest mushrooms to grow. It can be grown nearly anywhere outdoors on your property and requires no special tools to plant. The best key to success is to keep it in mind. Rule number one of mushroom cultivation, maintain moisture. Mushrooms require water and humidity to grow, so selecting an ideal location can really reduce your need for moisture management. Follow the six steps below for planting your wine cap mushrooms. Number one, select and prepare your substance, wood chips, straw, or both. I have straw, so that's what I'm going to use. Wood chip beds can produce mushrooms for several years. Soft wood chips, <clears throat> box elder, cottonwood, willow, soft maple, mang mang magnolia, etc. work best. Hardwood chips, oak, should be left outside to age for several months prior to use. Softwood chips should not be used except in certain circumstances. Wait a minute. Please check the website or call for information. If a wood chip, if the wood chips are dry, water them with a sprinkler until wet before proceeding. At first it says wood chip beds can produce mushrooms for several years. Soft, oh, soft hardwood chips, soft hardwood. Okay, so soft wood like pine should not be used. Okay. Straw beds can produce mushrooms quicker, but have a shorter overall life. Clean, weed-free straw, either oat or wheat is best. Water the straw until uniformly wet or soak for two or three days to hydrate and condition it, then drain before proceeding. The best of both worlds. Read about layering straw and wood chips. That probably seems like a good thing. I can, I know I can get wood chips. Select a bed location. Think about moisture maintenance. Shaded areas are best because beds will 
be less prone to drying and require less watering. Full sun beds are po possible but require more watering on your behalf. We like to plant in already mulched areas under trees on the shady side of our house or in around an ornamental plants. The beds should have a soil floor or mulched surface free from weeds. Planting the beds. The beds are created in layers. Sandwich the spawn between layers of substance. Place your first layer of substance down, then sprinkle spawn, spawn broken into pieces on top, then another layer of substance. More layers are even better. If you are using straw and wood chips, alternate layers of straw, spawn, and wood chips. The top layer should be wood chips. Bed depth depends on the substance you are using and location of the bed. Wood chips are less prone to drying out, so bed depth should be three to five inches. Straw is more prone to drying out so we recommend five to 10 inches. Shaded beds can be shallower. Sunny beds should be deeper. Create a thicker top layer of substance because that will protect the spawn underneath from drying out. Number four, maintaining and monitoring the bed. Again, think about moisture maintenance. We recommend checking your bed regularly at first. Dig down into the beds with your fingers. It should be damp, not wet. If it feels dry, then water with a sprinkler. A general rule of thumb is one inch of water per week, but that depends on bed depth, sun exposure, and wind. A well-made bed in an ideal location may need little to no maintenance. <clears throat> While you are digging in the bed, keep your eye out for white, branching, thread-like material we call mycelium kind of like the roots of a mushroom that is a great sign of successful wine cap growth wine caps are ready to fruit typically 2 to 11 months after planting keep an eye on your beds especially after rainfall or temperature fluctuations you can pick them when they are young in the button form or wait another day or two for the cap to open. Simply pluck them from the bed using your hands, cut the bottom of the stem off and store mushrooms in the refrigerator until you're ready to use. Note, always be sure to identify your mushrooms before you eat them. Wine caps are easy to identify, so please consult our resources listed below. Number six, bed rejuvenation. Wine cap mushrooms break down into bed substrate, substrate quickly. For this reason, straw beds usually only fruit for a single year. Wood chip beds may fruit for up to three years, but production will decline over time. When this begins to happen, you may try to rejuvenate your bed by feeding it fresh wood chips, simply adding several inches of chips to the top of your existing bed, ideally in spring or after a mushroom harvest. Bed rejuvenation is not a guarantee, but if the wine cap is still vigorous enough, it will begin to colonize the new materials and be ready for more fruiting several months later. Consider adding new spawn to the fresh materials for a mulch more success for a much more successful approach. Very good. All right, I'm I'm gonna do that one. We haven't done that one in years here. Uh, and I do like those kind of mushrooms too. I do like them. All right, what else we got here for info? I got a hi from Andres, Andres, Andres Lezinski. 
from Poland. I remember I asked you before. Yep. Andy's with us. Joy can be found in the garden says, thank you so much. I inoculate some down trees and wood chips. We'll see this spring. Thanks. I have a Mangalitsa breeding pair and started following you for that reason. Thanks, Dr. Joy. You know, I don't think, uh, I don't think we've even scratched the surface of the interconnectedness of all of these processes that we, uh, you know, you get into Mangalitsa and then you find out about masting. Dr. Joy, you want, you're going to want to read up on masting, right? Masting is a process by where you are releasing your pigs out into a wooded area to mast. And, and mast is one of those, it's a word that's a, uh, a verb, you know, you can mast and it's also a noun. You know, the stuff that you would gather is like you could go out in the woods and you can gather mast. And that would be, you know, acorns, walnuts, uh, you name it, anything like that. You pick it up and you bring it in and the pigs eat that. They eat the buds. They eat uh, any, you know, wild uh, roots that come up. Uh, they will get in and they will root up cattails and eat the bulbs on those. And I suppose that's, oh, terrible, right? Because it's wetlands. But who cares? Who else wants the cattails? Nobody else wants them. Uh, and if it's your land, it actually rejuvenates the land because it's not like these animals were brought here from Venus and they're, they're not part of this creation. They were, they were made to be here to disturb the creation so that new things could come forward. Wherever they go through and they root up a little bit, it looks terrible on a golf course, but in the woods, you don't hardly even notice it. And what happens when they root up in the golf in, in the in the woods is all of a sudden, ooh, a bunch of wildflowers come up from there. Where'd they come from? And then some pigs might come through and eat those too. But it's not necessarily a bad thing to use your pigs in your forest for forest management. It's really not. Um and if you learn how this is done, um, it falls right in line with what I will tell people when they take pigs from me. You know, they buy pigs from me and they say, well, I'm going to take them home. I'm going to put up, you know, a pallet fence. That should keep them in, right? And I'll say, no, you want to use electric fence on the inside and then woven wire on the outside. But people are still going to do what they're going to do. But when pigs get out, so long as they've slept someplace for a few nights, they'll come back. They, that's where their beds are. Come back to it. Um, might take more than a few nights, but you know, generally that's what how it works. So masting was used extensively uh, in logging camps and and other mining camps, other things like that. But logging camps typically because uh, you'd have a crew of people that ran the, the chow hall, right? And uh, they would also manage the pigs because pigs is, you know, it's a, it's a staple for feeding large groups of people. And let's say that you're in deep woods, you know, you're out there, you're, you're harvesting timber, you're in deep woods, you can't really have cattle out there. And cattle will wander off, they'll get lost, and they'll forget where they are so cattle have to be penned you know they can't just be turned loose with pigs uh you can turn them loose in the morning right and they'll wander out off the back of the cook's tent right the the chow hall they'll wander out they'll go into the forest and they will mast then when it starts getting uh on towards dusk and the evening meal is completed and all the lumberjacks have been fed all the garbage is thrown in the bucket the swilly bucket if you will and the, the cook goes out there on the back that and he bangs on that and he says suey and the pigs come running 
He dumps it down for them. They eat it. And then he goes back in, starts cleaning up, going to bed. They go to bed. They go in their beds. And maybe he will go out and close the gate. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. Just depending on what's going on out in the woods. You know, if there's grizzlies and stuff like that, they they might want to secure things a little bit better. But generally, they'd have dogs uh, to keep things in order during the night. But that's how masting was done. And it fits in very well with the, uh, you know, the logging um, process. It fits in very well with it. And then occasionally the cook, you know, would need meat. And so the pigs come in and bang, he shoots one of them. They bring that in and they butcher it. And you know, the rest is history. It's you having bacon for bacon for the loggers and, you know, like that. So nothing goes to waste. Uh, and pork is being generated just off the mast that's out in the forest. I mean, generally they are logging places where there's nobody, right? And so it's not like the pigs are going to get away. They're not going to want to move away from man because man is the one that is the bringer of food. And, and these are domestic animals anyway. So they'll wander out a ways, but they're always going to come back because when the cook yells suey, I mean, you don't want your pig friend to get there first. So you're going to be running to get in front of him. And that's the way it goes. Now, you can do that, too. The problem is when your pigs wander out these days, if they wander to your neighbor's house and get in their, uh, their vegetable garden, that could be a really bad thing. Obviously, that could be a real bad thing. So we don't really have the same ability to do that. However, if you had, let's say you have five wooded acres and you've got that whole five acres fenced in, yeah, you can do it then. On five acres, uh, the amount of mast that would be out there, let's say you had five acres of uh, mixed hardwoods and some of the hardwoods were oaks. And let's say some of the oaks are, you know, a foot across. So they're medium maturity oaks maybe uh you know the place was logged off in 1900 and you've got some oaks out there that are that big well let's say let's say it was logged in 1950 let's say then you'd have some oaks out there that are this big and that is what they would call one foot across that that's an average size oak i don't know why but that's what they call it an average size oak and, and then there is you know, twice as big. And uh, what happens to oaks, strangely enough, is they get so high and they're always getting the wind. The wind is much stronger up high and there's so much more stress on that oak. And sometimes they can go over like that. And uh, the reason they go over is because there's competition for root space, because there's so many more smaller oaks that could be like this big that are taking up valuable space. So when you get in there and you cut a lot of that smaller stuff out and use it for firewood and mushrooms, you're actually doing the, the place a favor. Let's say you've got an oak out there that's 150 years old. Uh, an average size oak will drop a ton, a ton, 2,000 pounds of, of acorns per year. Now, not every year some years they drop none some years they drop um about half but some years the ground will be this deep with acorns it's incredible and there's several different species there's red oak there's white oak there's you know pin oak i don't know how many species there are but there's several and like where i am a lot of them grow here so every year there's something and in areas like you can look at maps and you can see uh, if the red oaks are dropping a lot of acorns, then that's where the deer go because they like to eat them. And if it's another year where the red oaks are not doing so well and the pin oaks are, then this year, you know, we collect a lot of acorns for our pigs and it's sort of a thing that we do. Uh, my little kids called it going acorning. And it's, it's just something we do. Uh, 
and we have places we go where we've got some really good trees. There's one tree at the county park that it'd probably take three people to, to get around it. And the acorns that it drops are some of the biggest ones that I've seen. They're not like a golf ball, but they're like a, uh, they're pretty, they're pretty good size. They're the biggest ones. It's a red oak and you can just pick up thousands of them. And so we always go to that one first because it's really fun. And this year we went there and there was, uh, there's a few, you know, so pick up a handful of them, but that was it. So next year, maybe it'll, it'll really come through. You know, we have different places where we know that there's really good acorn. So it, if let's say that you had five acres and you managed that forest and it became a beautiful forest because you had a section over here where all of your mushroom logs were that you're clearing out as you systematically clear out the young stuff and use it for, oh, you could be using it for firewood, uh, mushroom logs, uh, I guess you could make fence posts out of it. I don't, I don't know. I don't make them out of that, but, but you, you could really make the forest look nice and uh, then do a fence project out there and have it broken into sections. Um, that could really be neat. And then just the fact that somebody is doing a masting program could be really, really interesting. It could, could be really something to show off uh, economically. Uh, let's say you've got, you know, on five acres, let's say you've got 20 trees, which would be, that could be pretty a conservative estimate. But let's say you've got 20 trees that are dropping a ton each average year after year. Some years they're going to drop two tons. That is a lot of feed that's hitting the ground for those pigs a lot right and you don't guess what you don't pay for that um those trees are going to produce that they're going to put their roots way down deep in the soil pull up all that nutrient grow all those beautiful leaves drop those leaves all that great bacteria that you have out there from your pig's manure is going to be working all in that soil and going to have a lot of worms out there a lot of grubs a lot of life going on your birds are going to come to your forest because they can fly around in there. Birds like that. Uh, when they have to fly in open area, like let's say they're going to hunt for mosquitoes and stuff in open area, then they're subject to birds of prey. So they don't like that. They would much rather hunt in under uh, a canopy. They would much rather do that. Uh, birds of prey. Uh, well, Birds of prey do hunt under a canopy. So if you were really disturbing the soil a lot with pigs, then you would get a lot of mouse action in there as well because there'd be channels that they could move. And then the birds of prey would come in too and be taking mice out. Not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's not, not a bad thing. It was That's how it's designed to work. Um, who knows what else you could incorporate into that? You could incorporate your chickens out there too with the pigs free roam, free ranging. You could. Uh, it just depends how things go. Uh, older pigs don't like to chase chickens. Uh, younger pigs, like 80 pounders, oh yeah, they like to chase chickens. And if they get one, that's the end of it. And then they'll try and get them again. Sometimes, not always. It's hard to know. Some years we'll have Freedom Rangers that will jump over the fence in with the pigs. Not a problem. Other years you see feathers in there. So evidently somebody's jumped in there. And, you know, the chickens don't learn. They don't say, hey, well, Tony got eaten by those pigs, so we better not go in there. They'll just go one right after another. And, you know, it's it's a, it's too bad thing but we'll incorporate into that shaded canopy um, you could put cattle in there you're going to have to be bringing in feed for them but then they're going to be putting their bacteria down too very good thing very nice thing 
Um, you could make sort of a sort of a food forest, but it would be food for the animals and habitat for the animals. And then you would be harvesting the animals out of there for yourself. And maybe if you had a an open area someplace else that your your garden was in and make sure you have that protected really well from the uh, the once in a while when a pig gets out, you want that protected because they can do oh, a lot of damage to the garden. That's why you always want to use electric when it comes to pigs. Okay. Good evening, PG. Here. PG. Good evening, PG here. Word from the Lord today. Father, be consciously aware God is your father. Be aware he is in you, your husband. He will protect you, keep you safe. That is your anointing. Knowing that is your lamp, oil, light. We always say that, you know, no fear. There ain't no fear. The cleric's with us, laughing. About what? Um... Created by divine design, Moss Faith, which ones did you use in Japan? In Japan, I didn't get those. It was some Japanese person that had set them up out in the woods. And then I went in there and I took them and I was going to use them for firewood. And eventually I did use them for firewood. But it wasn't until I got here that I realized, oh, that's why you stack them up like this. Because this is how we stack them too. Stack them up like that. You know, so you can pick the, you don't just, you don't stack them tight. You stack them like this so that you can get in there and you can get the mushrooms out. <laughs> well, Inga's saying I took them by mistake. Actually, you know, I took them on purpose, but I didn't realize what I was doing. Ghost is saying that's a pretty cool little tool. I have your have you considered producing your own song? Wouldn't be too hard from what I've seen. You know, I, I I have considered doing it, but I I just gotta get myself educated on it. I don't know how to do it. Um obviously it can be done because this guy's doing it, and you know what I should. I just gotta find out how to do it. Um, mass faith, uh, what you should do is you should consider the wine caps because you don't need any more than, you know, five square feet to do that or less. Uh, I think you can even do them in garbage bags or, uh, totes. You can do them in totes. Yeah, and Ghost is saying you can do them inside. But I know they have a little bit of room there. They have enough room to do it. They're not, uh, the question is, do they cross-pollinate? We have a lot of moisture and get wild mushrooms of all kinds. They're a fungus, so there's no pollen involved. It's not like they're going to cross um it they're not a they're not a flora they're not a plant they're a, a fungus Huh. 
it was something Paul had mentioned in the past. Joe Rogan asked him about that on his podcast, and Paul refused to talk about it, basically citing personal safety concerns. Retribution? I'm not sure what that's about. No, um, Moss Faith is saying, do they cross pollinate? No, they don't. Uh, what about putting on the north side of trees to keep out of the sun, or do they need sun? Uh, they don't need sun. No, you can grow them in total shade, and they recommend doing it in total shade just so uh, they will stay moist. But you can do it in, in sunlight, but then it's on you to keep them moist. And, you know. I suppose if you don't mind watering every every day. Okay, well, the ghost is getting into this a little deeper than I know, and he's answering, and he says, "Mushrooms won't crossbreed to form different types of mushrooms. A spore." print can give you literally thousands of different mycelium types that can be crossed to give you superior genetic traits though sort of like hybrid vigor in pigs it sounds but you're not going to get anything new our preppers cross pollinate our peppers cross pollinate and we got some weird peppers yeah i thought about this when mark was talking about wild poisonous mushrooms how to keep your spore pure, non-poisonous. Well, I guess we're covered there because they don't. Yeah, the ghost is backing me up on that. Oh, I see. Changed avatar name. PG here was created by Divine Design Moss Phase 3. We have coon coon pigs and chickens. Yeah, I know that. Haven't talked to those guys in a while. Mangalitsa meat is delicious from Audubon. There's a statement that I would have to agree with. The only problem I've heard of, though, is there's a similar looking poisonous breed that grows on the same type of substrate. This is a possibility with some wood lover magic breeds. Okay. I couldn't think of how to write it for spores, fungus. Okay. PG is Le Leah and Michelle's mom. Okay. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying there, ghost. Um, that type of mushroom. <coughs> oh, Portobello. Oh, okay. Hmm. There's <coughs> Portobello mushrooms, huh? Hmm. I kind of like them. I haven't had them in a long time, but I do when I have had them, I like them. <coughs> All right. Well, that's uh, that's my presentation about mushrooms. Gone an hour and a half. <coughs> It was rainy here today, so I fed this morning. What else did I do? Oh, I had to fix, fix pig fence. All of our snow is gone, and the pigs were pushing on the fence, and I went out there, and I noticed that uh, a lot of the fence was down. During the, the winter, it just gets torn up. <clears throat> um, not the woven wire, just the electric. And uh, you know that new electric fencer that I got, even though... The fence was laying on the ground. <clears throat> Some of it was covered up. The pigs still were staying away from it. So I got it all straightened out and put back up. 
and uh, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I got that new fencer last year. It was 300 bucks, but man, I'm so glad because it just they're not going to get near it now. So unless they find a rock and throw it up on it, um, I'm going to be good. And that's nice to know that you're not going to have problems with the pigs leaving for any reason. All right, I'm going to call it good right here. Oh, really? Ghost is saying the common button mush mushrooms are just immature portabella. Huh, I didn't know that. Well, these aren't buttons. These are wine caps. I, I'm not sure. Are they the same? Wine cap? Mm, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. Have to look into that. All right. I'm going to go. You guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. We will be coming back at you tomorrow night. Remember, anyone can farm and get out there and get this done. There needs to be a sense of urgency. Get her done.